o'clock. So hello everyone and welcome to the Gendered Organizational Practice Research Cluster. Um, my name is Nava Smolovich jones and I will be co-chairing this event with Nick Winchester, uh, my colleague from Business School at the Open University today. Uh, so as many of you already know, uh, GOP provides a space in which those, all of us dedicated uh, to gender equality can share insights from academic study and practice and it is open to all so please continue to write to us and to take part in our event now before i introduce our wonderful speaker some very light housekeeping uh the q a uh, pane is on your right and this is where you can type in your questions during or after melissa's talk uh, but i will ask you to please mute your mics and turn off your cameras if you're not speaking. Uh, you're probably accustomed to events like this, but I should just say that this session is being recorded so that we, that we can share it with the, um, those people who couldn't join us today. So the title of the, today's talk is uh, very intriguing. The air that we breathe, recognition, respiration and ambivalence. And it will be delivered by wonderful Professor Melissa Tyler, in her talk, she will explore the question of how we are so prone to divisions and destructions when we need one another to survive. And she will be doing that to draw the work of Judith Butler and the critical theory scholars Akil Membe and Axel Honneth. So I don't know about you, but I don't know anyone in our field who is more fluent in Butler's work than Melissa and who uh, could be better suited really to the task of amalgamating the two scholarly traditions. So I feel privileged that she came here at the Open University of the GOP uh, to share her insights about it with us. So without further ado, I'll pass you over to Melissa. Enjoy the talk and see you in the Q&A. Melissa, I will just uh, share your slides. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for inviting me to join you today. And thank you everybody for coming along and making the time to uh, take part in the discussion. I know it's a bit of a cliche, but people often say, oh, this is just work in development. These are ideas I'm exploring when actually it's a fully published, fully formed paper. But genuinely in this instant, these are ideas that I am just interested in. I haven't got a paper written. Um, I've just been thinking about them and exploring them. And so this has been a really ideal opportunity for me to kind of sound you out, really, and 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 just get people's thoughts on these ideas and, and how they might be developed further. So they're very embryonic. Um, I've got some study leave planned for the spring term. So the timing of this seminar today is absolutely perfect for me. And hopefully I will come away with lots of food for thought and 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 uh, areas of, of what I hope we'll talk about today that I need to do some more work on. So I'd like to take the opportunity to explore how thinking about the social relations of something as fundamental as breathing helps us to understand how our desire for recognition comes to be organised in ways that oppress and exploit us, but which also potentially open up scope for rethinking how we might live and work together differently. I should be clear that I am approaching respiration uh, philosophically, in some ways very literally, but in other ways more metaphorically. But I am not going to talk about respiration uh, in any kind of physiological sense. That's I think I've got nine percent on my biology exam at school. That's far from my area of expertise. Um, but my plan is to draw on recent discussions in critical social theory that highlight the ambivalent nature of recognition to explore how respiration illustrates in a very basic way how our embodied interdependence and relationality is a way of being that we can't ever somehow choose or will our way out of. The aim is to think about this as a, a kind of organisational problem um, in its broadest sense than to encourage a, a critical reflexive discussion um, of why we can't collectively see or sense our interdependence. But instead, we doggedly pursue what um, Ashil Membe um, calls a necropolitics of borderization. And by this, he means an approach to organizing our lives that involves a kind of shoring up of our differences and resources as a result. Um, specifically, I hope to kind of 
try to explore the question of why we're ambivalent about or hostile towards one another when and especially when it's so apparent to us that we breathe the same air. Failing to recognise our most basic mutual um, vulnerabilities. A critical question, of course, in the wake of a global respiratory pandemic and in the midst of a climate crisis. So I'd like to begin by setting out some basic premises that underpin um, the approach that I'm trying to take uh, and to what we might broadly call a phenomenology of respiration. If we can move on to the next slide, that'd be great. It's great having a technical assistant. Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, entirely because of my own ineptitude, I have to say. So first of all, the, the first premise that I'm working from is that ethics and politics, um, and there I really mean ethics, politics, because we can't separate off the two, stem from the way in which we're fundamentally mutually interdependent. So to put it very simply, we breathe the same air. As Merleau-Ponty emphasised, when I breathe in, um, others breathe out and vice versa. So secondly, we are driven by the desire for recognition of ourselves as viable, viable social beings who are worthy of rights, responsibilities and resources. We depend upon access to breathable air. And then thirdly, this desire for recognition is what drives our need for organisation. It renders us mutually inescapably vulnerable in an existential and embodied sense. A scenario, as I said, that we don't somehow grow out of. Uh, sometimes we simply cannot breathe unaided and our life course um, bookends this. Um, but it can happen to any of us at, at any time. So thinking about breathing in this way reminds us of just how mutually interdependent we are. And yet, of course, our social positioning means that if we are all mutually vulnerable, we are by no means equally so. Just to go back to Merleau-Ponty's point, as successive waves of viral, uh, racial, gendered violence have shown us, access to the right to breathe is not evenly spread, but is organised along axes of race, gender, social class, um, age, and of course, regionality and geography. Um, if COVID, Black Lives Matter and the climate emergency have taught us anything, it is that, as Judith Butler puts it, exposure is a socially organised relation. If we could move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. The whiter a person is, the less likely they are to be asphyxiated at the hands of a police officer. The more hegemonically male a person is, the less likely they are to be choked by a violent predator or partner. And the place and the circumstances in which a person lives shapes their chances of having access to ventilated oxygen when their breathing is compromised by illness or injury. And we've known for some time that the more privileged we are, the cleaner the air we breathe is likely to be and the more livable and workable our environment is likely to be. Um, the use of gas, of course, in wartime is perhaps the most extreme example that we can think of here. But this is a city in India, which is currently reported as the most polluted place on the planet. Respiratory um, poverty has a very long history, starting with at least the early stages of the industrial uh, revolutions and remains a significant cause of preventable um, death in many parts of the world, accentuated by climate change and intersections of precarity and exposure. Um, and access to pollu pollution or living in a polluted environment in this sense just reminds us so very acutely of how access to clean, breathable air, not just in the environments in which we live, but in which we work as well, as this nail bar uh, photograph illustrates here. Um, th th these illustrate to us just how this kind of access is really the preserve of the privileged few in the times in which we live. And for those fortunate enough to have unrestricted access to breathable air, the latter has even rapidly become the subject of strategic interventions into um, the kind of management of change discourses and techniques 
they're increasingly dominating our everyday lives and ways of being. So breathing then is becoming subject to imperatives and techniques of organisation, as indicated by the plethora of how to manuals that teach us how to use breathing techniques to improve our performance and productive output. Although, of course, we should note that this is something that midwives and doulas and professional performers, I'm doing work with opera singers at the moment, um, have long since known and practised. So our embodied interdependence and relationality is a way of being that we just cannot choose or will away. And breathing seems to illustrate this in a very fundamental way. Acknowledging this points to the idea that social justice can only emerge from a reimagined interdependency. Again, as Judith Butler has argued very persuasively, in my view, uh, the task is not to overcome the latter, but to recognise that this is our only way of being, i.e. that recognition of the mutual vulnerability engendered by our interdependency is not just a condition, but the condition of social justice. And a vital question for us to reflect on then is why we can't collectively see and sense this, even in the wake of a global uh, respiratory pandemic. Um, if we could move on to the next slide, please, that'd be great. Thank you. To illustrate this point, those who chose not to wear masks or to socially distance refused to acknowledge and act on our interdependency and to make the required ethical shift to be for and with a generalised other. In the UK, at least, mask wearing declined very rapidly once scientific evidence began to emerge that um, so-called breath diverting, the cloth masks that most people wore, primarily protected other people rather than oneself, i.e. by containing the spread of um, viral particles from our exhalation. So this kind of self-righteous necropolitics to draw on um, Membe's writing reinscribes a, a kind of spurious distinction that Butler has been so um, critical of between what she describes as grievable and ungrievable lives. That is between those people who feel and assert their sense of having a right to be protected at all costs at the expense of those whose lives are considered not worth recognising or safeguarding or is not mattering at all. And something as basic as a small piece of cloth seems to illustrate how this applies to individuals and groups and to a generalised other in a very profound way. It is, of course, important not to fall into the trap of romanticising social relationality. And I think there is a real risk of doing that when drawing on these ideas. In The Force of Nonviolence, Butler reminds us that hostility is part of our psychic constitution. So that the field of social relationality, far from being uh, one shaped by um, love and interconnectedness, is a fraught one characterised by negativity. So relationality is not simply um, unproblematically a good thing, but is rather, as she puts it, a vexed and ambivalent field in which the question of ethical obligation has to be worked out and crucially struggled over. Recognition is easier to comprehend, of course, with reference to those who we see as like ourselves, um, who we identify with, wish to protect and love and care for. But it's so much more complex when it uh, is applied to those we're hostile towards, including those whose beliefs and ways of life we may find abhorrent. The dialectical and socially situated um, nature of relationality means that this working out then is a process of ongoing struggle, one that's played out through the body as the social relations of respiration illustrate um, very helpfully. Further, while our way of being is one situated in, in interconnection, we live and work under another threat to this idea of kind of um, championing or, or, or wanting to immerse ourselves in relationality, and that is the fantasy of autonomy relating to one another through a frame of reference that posits dependency as negativity and which in doing so erases our basic and ongoing mutual vulnerability. An example of this, of course, um, is the perception often mobilised in discourses around end of life care, for example, um, that a dependent life is not a real life or a life lived fully with any so-called quality. If we wish to understand this fantasy, that is the fantasy of discrete autonomy, in order to think and act beyond it. And I think as, as feminists, that's something that we're continually striving for. 
we have to be able to imagine ways of being and relating to one another, one another that do not effectively write out or write off dependency and which keep our hostility or our kind of always potential for hostility in check. Hegel narrates the scene of subjective inauguration as one of struggle between master and slave, through which each comes to recognise the other through working through struggle. And he sees this very much as a normative process. Each is transformed um, through the struggle and can never return um, to, to, to the kind of form of self that existed prior to that struggle. Butler's reading of Hegel leads her to argue that an annihilation has already taken place prior to Hegel's narrated scene. She calls this um, a murder that has no trace. She, she writes about this as an expulsion of some sort um, that has taken place. And within that vacated place, she says, is erected the adult man. So the adult man as the ideal subject, unencumbered and self-reliant. Again, refusing to wear a mask as a misguided show of bravery or resilience and as an assertion of personal freedom illustrates this perfectly. My body, my choice. Further, this mytholo mythological adult man is understood to encounter others only in a conflict ridden way. His goal is to preserve his freedom by being totally self-sufficient. Butler's Hegelian perspective does not, of course, lead her to argue against the primary character of conflict, as I've said. She insists, like many others, that every social bond is in part a conflict. Her concern is what, with what keeps this, in, this conflict in check, preventing it from becoming destructive, particularly in circumstances in which social relations are already premised upon this primordial annihilation. Her thesis is that if non-violence, a politics premised on keeping destruction in check, is to make sense as an ethical and political way forwards, it cannot simply repress aggression, but rather it, it, is, it has to make sense as an ethical and political position. It emerges then in this respect as a meaningful concept precisely when destruction is most likely or seems most certain, i.e. when we are at our most vulnerable struggling for breath, for example, or struggling for access to safe, clean air. A question for us then is what accounts for that check? What might keep us in check? Some would argue that it's the superego. Of course, that's not necessarily my view, but uh, I appreciate that that, that that is the view that is taken by uh, those who respond to these questions. Others that it is the law or that it's coercive state power. Others still that it comes from a calm or pacific region of the soul, one that we ought to cultivate through spiritual practices. Recognition theorists such as Butler argue that this destruction is and can only be checked by mutual affirmation, a recognition of what we've ostensibly forgotten or written out of our social field, that is the obligation that stems from our mutual interdependency. However, Butler's articulation of um, what an alternative to this might entail is somewhat vague. She says simply that critical patience is required. But of course, for many of us, particularly as we, you know, we're thinking about a winter fuel crisis, the mounting cost of living, all of the problems that that is going to create for people, patience is running a little thin. And so the key challenge then is to consider how the relationship between vulnerability, violence and resistance might be rethought through recognition and relationality. In other words, beyond um, reification. So the task in this sense is not to designate a class of people as vulnerable and to offer them paternalistic protection as organisational policies and practices, particularly those associated with HRM, tend to, but rather to take seriously Butler's point that vulnerability and resistance are not opposing forces or ways of being, but are dialectically interconnected. And I think some of the work that certainly um, people here who, who are joining us today um, ha, are, are engaging with is really exploring different ways in which we can think of vulnerability and or vulnerability as 
resistance. Um, highlighting and really foregrounding how presence, persistence, simply existing can become an ethical political act. Could we move on to the next slide, please? Thank you. Understood in this way, demonstration has at least two important meanings for our purposes in, in this discussion. First of all, demonstration, of course, refers to something which is shown, enacted, incorporated bodily. And secondly, of course, we think of demonstration in a political sense as opposing or standing against. And this duality is important. It shows what Butler calls the knotted position of the subjected subject. Uh, by at once exposing and opposing its own subjugation. So this dialectic, if you like, of um, simultaneous exposure and opposition, a showing, a sh I was going to say a showing and telling, but it's actually a telling through showing, constitutes what Butler maps out as a politics of nonviolence or as vulnerability as resistance as a counter to reified social relations, i.e. ways of relating that forget our mutual vulnerability, protecting and preserving resources such as safe, clean air, warmth, shelter and security. By appearing and assembling in this kind of way, we've got here um, a, a Me Too demonstration in India, we've got the anti-Trump marches um, that took place following Trump's inauguration, reciting his references to um, women as collectively pussy. And um, in the early 80s here, there's a photograph from the die-ins that were staged, particularly in New York, um, as a way of saying, see, here we are. We will not accept the subject position that you are um, evoking for us or hailing, to borrow Althusser's term, us into. I'm just looking at the detail of that side. I really would not want to eat a sandwich that Trump had made me. I'm sure you agree. Um, so um, thinking about um, connection and vulnerability and resistance in, in this way is a way of thinking about how appearing in an assembling as being exposed and opposed simultaneously constitutes a claim to recognition uh, and a demand to live a livable life whose hypothetical loss would be recognised as such. For subjugated people and groups, this involves effectively asserting their grievability within the public and the media spheres, appearing and assembling at once a coming together and a constituting as a performative and embodied persistence. Examples of this um, might include, if we have a look at the next slide, please. Thank you. So some of further examples of this might include, um, for instance, the post pulse shooting candlelit vigils that assembled around the world. This is a photo that I took of Old Compton Street in Soho in June 2016. Um, social media groups and communities that connect LGBT people living in extremely hostile circumstances. This photograph on the right is of um, Jakub um, Kiviachinski and um, his um, husband, uh, David Majcek, um, a married gay couple who made and distributed rainbow masks in Poland uh, in 2020 that Nick Rumans talked about in his gender work and organisation plenary last year. And he talked about the work that they're doing as a form of vulnerability in resistance. And we might, uh, of course, anticipate something similar could be said about people assembling in uh, what are rapidly emerging as, as, uh, as being referred to as warm air banks in the UK this winter. In the way in which Butler develops it, Hannah Arendt's uh, concept of the space of appearance becomes persistence. And I think we can kind of see that in this candlelit vigil here. Contra some of the current managerially orientated discourses of endurance and resilience as an assertion of the right to a livable and grievable life. The body in this sense acts on its own um, dexis, as Butler puts it. It becomes a living sign that says here, it's a pointing to or an acting of the body that implies its situation. This body 
These bodies, these are the ones exposed to violence, resisting disappearance. These bodies exist still, which is, as Butler puts it, to say that they persist under conditions in which their very power to persist is systematically undermined. Returning to her ongoing dialogue with Adorno, Butler argues that a good life will only ever be a, a life lived with others, as the I always requires a you in order to survive and flourish. Beyond this, the I and the you need a sustaining world, a ground for social relations that constitutes the global context for nonviolence and the obligations we bear towards one another. The problem for us is that in organisational terms, the risk becomes one of offering or accepting a kind of faux or a false recognition, a rhetorical rather than a relational form that replaces a reification of vulnerability, a kind of forgetting of mutual vulnerability in the process of designating some groups as vulnerable and in need of protection and others as invulnerable with a reification of value. And we see that in something like, just to continue with the rainbow theme, we see that in things like pride themed ranges of merchandise in um, sort of corporate settings, um, corporate sponsorship of these kinds of gatherings. And also, of course, perhaps most obviously in managing diversity discourses, which represent very little more than um, a kind of reification and co-optation of difference under the guise of uh, recognition. And I want to argue that that's a, a false or a faux form of reified recognition. Writing in early 2020, in the midst of the first COVID outbreak and echoing Butler's perspective on vulnerability in and as resistance, Neil Howard, uh, working at University of Bristol, argues that we must proceed by acting as if each individual life is all of our lives. Um, if our response to recent and ongoing global challenges is to approximate anything potentially transformative, as he puts it, a pandemic brings home that we are all made of the same stuff. We're all human, vulnerable, and thus in need of care. This embodied experience of our shared vulnerability is extremely connecting, he argues. My view on that, my response to that would be, it should be. To situate this, a related risk, additional to that uh, noted a second ago about reified forms of recognition, is that the kind of recognition that um, Neil Howard is talking about here, our realisation that social detachment is impossible, is or was just a fleeting moment that waned very quickly as we reopened the economy uh, following a business as usual mantra. Lockdown ended, social distancing ended, and, um, and, and, and life continued ostensibly normally for the vast majority, or for the privileged majority, I should say. Howard describes four overlapping scenarios that might help us to recapture or to organize the radical potential of this moment of recognition into something more sustainable. Could we move on to the next slide, please? Thank you. So Howard outlines four moments. The first moment is when we begin to realise that the systems we live with leave just too many people uncared for or unsafe or vulnerable to being so. The second is when we sense that other ways of being and of doing things are possible. The third moment is marked by what he calls the eruption of long suppressed needs into the mainstream of public and political life, including the domain of social media, with care returning as a central principle for our collective being. And moment four, the pinnacle, is characterised by the critical hope that it might be possible for us to live in a world set up to care for and attend to our needs rather than one focused on accumulation. And this is very much the kind of anticipation of the Care Collective's manifesto written in the, in the wake of COVID. Our individual and collective shared needs, e.g. for food, shelter, care, connection and meaning, are threads of vulnerability that bind us and also in being so threads of possibility, Howard argues. Evoking um, critical theorist Ernst Bloch, Howard concludes that in the re-emergence of care, as the always ever there foundation of our lives, there is a profound critical reflexive hope 
Our challenge is to organise that hope towards the caring alternative reality that began to make itself visible during COVID. Yet this recognition seems to have been stalled, I would say probably with no empirical certainty or substance whatsoever, somewhere between moments one and two. Move on to the next slide. Um, we can see a very different perspective on the situation we find ourselves in. So a very different point of view is offered by post-colonial theorist Achille Amembe in his discussion of necropolitics. For Amembe, necropolitics constitutes a force of separation rather than one that is bond intensifying, a scenario in which the other's burden is intolerably overwhelming and we're becoming different to the other's suffering. And I think the way the UK is dealing with um, sort of um, migrants and asylum seekers is a really clear, very shameful example of that, in part because we've become fixated on the other's difference. In other words, we reify the other's difference. Membe illustrates this with reference to the way in which nano-racism um, infiltrates into the pores and veins of society, into the very air one breathes. And he asks, in these circumstances, can we find a relation with others based on the reciprocal recognition of our current common vulnerability? And he's pessimistic, or certainly much less optimistic than Neil Howard. When confronted with the challenges of exercising life and freedom amongst those we can only regard as different from ourselves. Nano-racism, he argues, captures the spirit of our times, taking pleasure in ignorance and claiming a right to stupidity and immunity from responsibility for the violence it engenders. And I mean, Trump's social media um, kind of postings are just, you know, such an, a clear example of that, resulting in an ongoing struggle over difference. Uh, with no possibility of mutual recognition and instead a way of living in which the experience of being unrecognised, humiliated, alienated uh, and mistreated has become the norm, a human condition of miss or non-recognition defined by difference. The challenge then becomes how to respond when recognition is decoupled from desire, i.e. through encounters with those whose mere existence or proximity to us is deemed to represent a physical or existential threat to our own lives and whose recognition we neither seek nor proffer. Bodies that are deemed to pollute by their very presence. This scenario, Mbembe argues, is on the verge of defining the times in which we live in an area in an era which is rapidly becoming an age terrified of itself and of its own excess. Shape, in other words, by excess here he means that with that which we cannot absorb into the self. Um, shaped by forces of separation and fixity, in which for some quite literally it becomes impossible to breathe. So amongst all of this despondency and pessimism, what can we do? It seems that the concerted actions of our bodies assembled physically and virtually in whatever way we can to resist and protest against precarity, the destruction of the conditions of live and workability must be combined with an assemblage of resources so that a livable life becomes more possible for more living beings. A question for us, those of us who are interested in gendering organisational practices and in organisational lives and feminist politics and solidarity more broadly, is what role can and should modes and practices of organisation play in this? Does it become a question to revisit some of the emancipatory potential in, say, Axel Honneth's writing on recognition, to struggle for a shift from a kind of reificatory, recitational organisation of our lives, e.g. through matrices of cultural intelligibility, as Butler and others have written about it, to a more relational and crucially, I think, reflexive recognition-based organisation for our lives. And what organisational form might this rather vague, romanticised, latter notion take and what possibilities might it open up for a critique of reification or reified recognition in particular. Clearly when understood as an organisational problem recognition becomes more complex than Neil Howard or the Care Collective suggest 
and is not necessarily so easily thought of or experienced as the social good that recognition theories such as Honneth might have us believe. But considering different ways of understanding recognition, and perhaps a rereading Hegel's writing on the desire for recognition opens up some interesting possibilities for thinking critically and reflexively about organisational forms of recognition. Recent debates on recognition in critical social theory, engaging with different ways of reading Hegel's work and its uptake in people like Althusser, Butler and Honneth, think about recognition as a very ambivalent phenomenon, something we can't live with in the form it takes or that we can't live without. And hence, we and then hence these discussions provide an interesting starting point, I think, for considering some of the issues that we've looked at so far. Namely, that we're all interconnected, but the mutual vulnerability that this engenders all too easily becomes the basis for exploitation and appropriation. And our social positioning means that while we're all vulnerable in an existential philosophical sense, we are by no means equally so um, politically, socially or ethically. In other words, while we all breathe the same air, as Merleau-Ponty says, some have a perceived right or an access to more breathable air than others. And I'm thinking both literally and metaphorically here as people, of course, talk about the kind of gendered and the classed and the race, racialized axes around which the idea of having breathing space um, are, are meaningful. Um, Butler's account of how the desire for recognition might turn out to be a vehicle of and for domination makes a really critical and helpful distinction, I think particularly for those of us in organisation studies, uh, between recognition and recognisability. At the risk of oversimplification, it strikes me that she does two interesting and important things with Hegel that open up critical scope for thinking about the crucial question of why we got stuck between those two moments of potentially emancipatory recognition that uh, Neil Howard maps out for us, noted earlier. So Butler's steps. First of all, I think she takes Hegel back a step foregrounding the importance of understanding how the desire for recognition as he narrates it comes to be organised according to normative, not simply cognitive or classificatory, as Honneth would have it, terms of recognisability, that in the context of contemporary organisational life require us to forget or reify our primary interdependency and mutual vulnerability, so that when we encounter one another, the desire or the terms of recognition are already uh, predetermined or shaped by certain expectations around who and what the, the recognisable subject can be. So when we ask who emerges as an intelligible life, as a recognisable subject, um, we are asking questions then about the field of intelligibility which has profound implications for the kind of recognition that we might be able to take forward ethically and politically. Secondly, I think Butler takes Hegel on a stage, in a sense by reading him both philosophically but also sociologically, highlighting how the differential terms of recognition mean our recognisability, mean that while we're all vulnerable or precarious in a philosophical sense, because we desire recognition and that makes us vulnerable, it opens us up to the vagaries of the other, we are not equally so because of our social positioning, emphasising how the exploitation of our primary vulnerability um, becomes the basis of our social appropriation. So the vulnerability engendered by our mutual interdependence becomes the social basis of our exploitation and appropriation. So while we're not all socially precarious, we are all philosophically vulnerable and the the, the latter is the basis of the former, if that makes sense. Um, and this, again, has important implications for how we understand the organisation of vulnerability, one that affirms an unequal distribution of our primary vulnerability and differential experiences of it. <clears throat> 
Taken together, these lines of argument present recognition in a much more complex and ambivalent light than Hegel's original narrative or Honneth's sophisticated but largely affirmative teleological development of it. I'll only be five minutes more. Showing how recognisability and recognition are dialectically related, we might even say organised, enables us to understand the epistemological conditions governing what it means to be accorded recognition and its normative consequences. Butler's non-teleological -tele reading of Hegel has important implications then, or possibilities, for responding to these kinds of questions that we're considering here, insofar as it highlights that our desire for recognition renders us socially, organisationally vulnerable in at least two important ways. First, often our only choice is to be recognised in ways and according to terms that are beyond us, perhaps according to terms which are nano-racist, to go back to a membe or sexist, uh, kind of um, the, the everyday sexist terms that we just constantly encounter within organisational life, and which therefore lead to our subordination or at least our constraint, um, or not being recognised at all. And this may happen to us unreflexively, or sometimes more tactically, where we consciously embody subject positions that we know to be oppressive in the service of a kind of, you know, greater individual or collective ends. And I'm thinking, for example, here of people who don't see themselves or live their lives as disabled, but who identify with disabled as a kind of political label, um, as an act of solidarity or as a political tactic. Jennifer Slack. Second, um, even when we have recognition that might be livable hey, or workable for us. I'm an online lecture right now. Can I call you back? <laughs> yeah, sure. OK, no OK. Sorry, can you mute, please, your microphones? Uh, whoever was having a phone conversation, we were able to hear it. So Thank you. Thanks. No confidential, I think. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, please don't worry, but thank you. Um, so second, even when we achieve recognition that might be livable or workable for us, um, the terms we're subject to are never fixed or stable. And there is no recognition of all that a person is or might be, as Butler emphasises. Hence, we're perpetually vulnerable, even when we are recognised. So, um, or rather, to put it more specifically, we're vulnerable in perpetuity. And organisations are important social contexts in which these dynamics are played out. Um, if we can have a quick look at the next slide, I think a good example of this is the way that um, NHS and, and health and, and other um, social care workers um, in the UK and also many other parts of the world were hailed, again to use Althusser's terms, um, as heroes during um, the um, kind of COVID pandemic for the work that they did. They were positioned uh, it, it, within uh, terms which were not of their own making and which failed to recognise all uh, uh, of what and who they are, in, in fact, disavowing their skills, their experiences, their labour and their expenditure of time and energy way beyond their contractual obligations. Um, but this vulnerability also opens up, I think, important possibilities that might be transformative and which raise questions for thinking about the kinds of work and the organisational forms and relations potentially involved. So if, for example, norms are resignified by bodies that are not supposed to embody them and that can change the way we think about embodiment and norms and social transformation, what kind of work do these bodies do? How might we understand the nature of this resignificatory labour? What kind of organisational infrastructures or relations might enable such bodies to enact individually and collectively transformative ways of being and of relating to one another? And again, we might think here of disability and trans rights groups whose persistence as simply a presence within and for organisations is of political and ethical significance. And also about the claims to recognition and rights made by indigenous people or by states, stateless people. We have a quick look at the next slide. Um, we can just see, for example, here, these are indigenous groups of people in um, Australia and in uh, Canada repositioning themselves, demonstrating by saying, he, see here, we do not accept the terms of recognition on offer. We do not accept the subject positions into which you are hailing us. Um, and doing so 
politically um, and crucially, I think, reflexively. Butler's view has long been that recitation constitutes a possible source of emancipatory change from the outside, from the domain of non-intelligibility. So at stake here is the question of a subaltern agency, as Moira Lloyd has been writing about recently, or a refusal in a Sheila Membe's terms. For some writers, the possibility, I think um, Thomas Stahl is one of them, the possibility of emancipation lies in standing in solidarity with those threatened by exclusion or expulsion from the sphere of recognition and those rendered non-intelligible by its terms. But for, for me, I think the risk of shoring up paternalism in these modes of kind of recognition and assembly is just too great. So perhaps another way in which the Hegelian narrative might be extended to our current sphere of interest is by combining political and philosophical lines of argument that connect post-recognition solidarity and pre-recognition vulnerability in order to develop a reflexive relational understanding of recognition and its ambivalence, one that has the potential to form the basis of a critical, reflexive, ethically and politically orientated theory of our encounters with one another. In other words, to take us back to that question of why we just can't see and sense how interconnected we are. Um, so in other words, it's, it might be one avenue through which we could develop a response to the question of why we don't recognise our mutual vulnerability, even and especially when we breathe the same air. Drawing on Butler's attempts to take Honneth both backwards and forwards a step and to respond to Honneth's critique of her alleged confusion between two forms of recognition, a cognitive or classificatory form and a more normative emancip <coughs> excuse me, emancipatory form, we might start to tease out, I think, potentially, a distinction between different forms of recognition as organisational phenomena. And I'm doing this very tentatively, but I would really love to hear your thoughts on this. So if we could go on to the final slide, that would be great. Um, first, I think we can identify a rhetorical, largely negative, ideological form of recognition that is not simply cognitive or classificatory in harmless terms, that's too simple, but establishes the terms of intelligibility or recognisability in Butler's. An example of the latter might be something like employee recognition schemes, or for those of us who have been unfortunate enough to be involved with them, something like Athena Swan. The very terms of Athena Swan were very much about, you know, that this was about women's experiences and dealing in very binary um, ways of classifying um, people within the organisation. Um, so that would be one example. Philip Hancock argues that such programmes are replete with pathological tendencies towards reification, disrespect and compelled identification, uh, which means that they basically just become cheap and instrumentally effective normative groundings for organisational life, constituting um, a form of recognition that is all too easily appropriated. This way of thinking about recognition as reification is illustrated, I think, in the discourses and practices um, around sort of healthcare heroes. It basically turns recognition into an object or a property that can be possessed or coveted and celebrated and championed within managerial discourses, reifying the subjectivities, the labour and social relations of mutual interdependency involved. Um, it reduces recognition to a thing like status. Second, I think we can identify the kind of recognition that Honneth is preoccupied with, which is uh, what we might broadly call full or affirmative normative recognition that he sees as an emancipatory process, one that reinstates our social bond and is hence transformative, but which if read through Butler and perhaps also through her reading of Hegel, uh, potentially risks um, a kind of paternalistic shoring up, but also failing to fully recognise the ambivalence engendered by the terms of recognition, i.e. the normative effects of what Butler calls recognisability. So when we question recognition here from a feminist perspective, we might say whose recognition and on whose or what terms. 
Um, and I'm thinking here, for example, around activist groups that claim to give people voice and representation when perhaps that's not what they want or their life circumstances means that they simply just don't have time for that level of engagement with voice and representation. They don't want the hyper visibility that goes with that. So it's this kind of maybe it's a sort of paternalistic, philanthropic, misguided form of recognition, maybe. Um, but I'm speculating here. Um, finally, it might be possible, I think, to think about a more reflexive, non-teleological, dialectical version of, of recognition involving participation in a reflexive problematization of the relations and terms of recognition and of our differential investments in them, including the norms that govern recognizability, recognizing reflexively that claims to recognition are always already normatively embedded and are grounded in a forgotten or reified social relation of mutual interdependence. Oh, if we could go on to the next slide here, there's something I want to show you. This is the kind of recognition that I think links the sort of work on feminist solidarity that is being undertaken in the gendered organisational practices cluster, foregrounding the importance of work uh, around exposing and dispelling and of reframing perceptions of entitlement. Um, drawing on Franz Fanon's writing, it's the kind of thing that Ashil and Membe argues um, can be a kind of reflexive recognition informed by critical theory, feminist writing and post-colonial theory, one marked by an individual and collective refusal as organised struggle. Uh, one that aims to bring about a new set of relations between people, things and resources. Um, and here we have a healthcare worker um, saying, please don't call me a hero. I'm being martyred against my will, refuting that um, beckoning or hailing into that subject position. And Membe goes on to argue that this kind of recognition is one that engages everything and to me the way that he writes about this evokes some of the work that Alison Pullen has been doing fascinating work looking at well if I connect her approach to writing as a political practice um, with ethics and politics it's a very uh, crude way of kind of summarizing the the contribution that she's making but I sort of think of it as a kind of getting down and dirty it's a way of thinking about politics and ethics viscerally um, and, and a Membe argues that this mode of recognition engages everything, muscles, bare fists, intelligence, the antithesis of the kind of wallowing in ignorance and stupidity and absolving responsibility uh, referred to earlier. The suffering from which one is not spared, blood, a new gesture, it creates new respiratory rhythms. This is the sort of struggle that involves organised collective work and a recognition based reinstatement of a relation of care premised not on paternalism, but recognition of our primal and ongoing vulnerability. The latter recognises or embodies the idea that when I breathe out, others breathe in and vice versa, potentially opening up a way to explore recognition beyond reification and respiration as illustrative, I suppose, of how mutual vulnerability is literally enacted through the air that we breathe. Thank you so much. I think I'll leave it there. That's everything I wanted to cover. Thank you so much for helping out with the slides. I'm so grateful to you. Um, thank you. I'm going to start talking now and hand over to you. Uh, well, thank you very much for this uh, really thought provoking uh, presentation. Uh, I think we have overrun time, so so the presentation lasted closer to to an hour than half an hour that we normally take. But I think it was necessary because of the rich kind of just of the breadth of theory that you're working uh, with here. Um, you know, feminist theory, critical theory, post-colonial, and and uh, race theory. Uh, so I have so many questions. I haven't had a, <laughs> I haven't haven't had the chance to check uh, the chat because I was sharing the screen. Um, yeah, I can see that people have uh, uh, asked uh, some questions, uh, but yeah, 
if I could kick off with, with a few of, of mine before I, with one of mine before I kind of turned to, to chat. Um, I was wondering, uh, you know, you talked about uh, uh, emancipatory potential of, of, of this project of, of recognition, and I was just uh, uh, wondering, is there a place uh, for emancipation in your reading of recognition, drawing on uh, Butler and, and others, post-colonial and, and critical theory? So if we come to learn that our desire for recognition is something that is organized in ways that oppress and exploit us, as you say, would such realization necessarily provide us with direction for enacting change in your, in your view? Um, yeah, I, I would very much hope so. I think the ideas that I'm currently trying to work with, um, I guess, the, the detail and substance of how, say, vulnerability in and as resistance might be enacted and embodied individually and collectively is really quite underdeveloped. That's why I was looking to examples of kind of protesting as simply a standing together. That at the moment, I think, is the best example I can think of, of um, uh, an empirical illustration within activism of the kind of philosophical theoretical argument that people like Butler and Membe are, are making um, and of how the potential that they're opening up might be realized in practice. But beyond that, I can't really think of very many examples of the different forms that that sort of um, mode of assembling might take. I mean, I guess, you know, I could equally look to say social media, you know, where there are very, I'm, I'm guessing there are really clearly, I mean, some of the LGBT communities that exist online are perhaps also good examples of that. Um, but yeah, I'm sure there are other forums in which it would be possible to identify examples of these theoretical ideas being enacted in practice. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I hope you're right, uh, and especially in relation to what you said about the kind of the struggle or or the violence that may come with the, the, the project of recognition, that sometimes we kind of go, you know, uh, embrace these uh, uh, normative fra frameworks that also oppress us. Uh, just out of that sheer desire to recognize and uh, being recognized. And I um, I know that I found that uh, in my research as well and other people's research, where, for instance, I encountered a women women's in for, formal politics who act as the most ruthless soldiers of patriarchy, just because this affords them a, a sort of recognition in this patriarchal socioeconomic order in which they operate. Um, and they know that it it oppresses them in some ways, but they still they still kind of act against their own kind of self preservation, I suppose. So what could act? I guess that's a, re a related question to the previous one. What could act as an obstacle to emancipation? Why is is it that the impetus to be recognized? recognized often overrides the values of, of people lives you said yourself in your examples um how people refuse to wear masks uh you know at the detriment of others or you know striving to be recognized as patriots some people turn a blind eye to immigrants drowning in the sea so mm. what is it that prevents us to to see each other as codependent and and equally vulnerable yeah, I mean, you know, I, I guess that question is the is the very basis of of everything I'm hoping to explore more. Um, I mean, I think Sasha has has raised a point there about mask wearing that for some people, particularly those whose health is already compromised, um, you know, breathing toxic or contaminated or um, unsafe air that, that contains viral particles is 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 literally a matter of life and death so why do we not see that why are we not why even when we are aware of that do we still act in a way which is 
self-interested. And why, to go back to your question specifically, might our desire for recognition override that sense of our, our desire for one form of recognition, override our sense of other our, our, our need for something which we might broadly call a more authentic or genuine form of recognition and that I think is actually quite important teasing out not only the different subject positions that recognition in different forms be, uh, beckons or hails us into but also the different forms of recognition that operate so for example in the workplace you know we might occupy a position tactically knowing that it is oppressive to us but which it might but which might somehow you know we take one for the team it might have a, a collective benefit or we might feel that it has a longer term benefit or we might occupy a position which accords us a certain form of recognition which we either know consciously or are um we disregard whether it does or not um, potentially does harm to others and kind of to go back to Adorno's basic point then that's not really recognition because we can never live a good life if it's at the expense of a damaged life for others which then leads me to start to think about different forms of recognition and I guess sorry this is a very roundabout response to your question but if we start to tease out or think about different forms of recognition Rec forms of recognition which oppress us even if that's knowingly or which oppress others knowingly or otherwise aren't recognition they're ideological they're rhetorical they're reifying um, they're not the kind of reflexive relational forms of recognition that I think you know feminist writers are are doing much more interesting work um, with they're almost kind of um, tactical I guess we could say tactical forms of recognition yeah thank you very much uh, so Nick said wouldn't this be Hornet's point um, uh, but I don't know which part of or, or he was referring to um, Nick do you want to just connect and yeah that's easier again thanks for the kind of presentation I'm sort of seeing this from a new, from from a different perspective, from more Honnett, uh, mm -hmm. that kind of perspective. So Honnett does talk about different forms of recognition, has a strong kind of normative basis. So when we talk about the kind of reification forms or things that oppress us, his simple argument would be, well, that isn't recognition because yeah. he's holding the concept as normative. Um, that may make it too simplistic, may make it too pure, perhaps even a little utopian. But I wonder if there's room, perhaps I'm circling around here, for a, a better dialogue between Honnett and Butler in this space. So mm -hmm. at the moment, I feel I'm certainly in the literature and in the, and in the exchange between Honnett and Butler, which I think is very poor on both sides. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lack of, I'm going to use the phrase, recognition of each other's views. Um, and to follow that for a moment, um, where do you see the main distinctions between Honnett's and sort of Butler's account of recognition and where you think Butler adds value that Honnett doesn't grasp in this context? Oh, wow, that's a fabulous question and one I'm probably not very well equipped to answer, certainly not as well as well as you are. Um, I agree with you. I think, well, first of all, let me just say, yes, I think there was a, a, a lot of interest from my point of view and merit potentially uh, for those of us interested in recognition, particularly how the concept of recognition applies to understanding organisational life. Um, so I think there is a lot of merit in bringing them um, into dialogue and there are two ways of doing that one is engaging with the discussion that they're already involved with and I agree with you they seem to read past each other um, although I think their earlier discussions um, on recognition you know are, are also particularly helpful um, but their recent discussions on ambivalence um, uh, I've you know I've been drawing on and thinking about those a lot uh, very recently so there's that but there is also a way I think to bring them into discussion with each other by reading them sort of separately rather than reading their own dialogue um, but I think Butler I, I think one thing I think Butler does some more interesting work with Hegel than potentially Honneth gives her credit for I'm intrigued 
and I think her own retort to Honeth emphasises this. I'm intrigued by the way she makes an important distinction between recognition and recognisability. Um, I'm also quite intrigued by the way in which she is at pains to emphasise that recognition and the field of recognition is always fraught with conflict. And I think, you know, potentially she connects to um, writing by some of the other feminist writers like Nancy um, Fraser, for instance, who, who look at um, how problematic, from a feminist point of view, Honest's kind of antecedent form of recognition around love, um, for want of a better term, it doesn't really encapsulate it, but um, how problematic that is, because in a sense, that's a good illustration of the kind of denigration or the inaugural disavowal that Butler is concerned about, because a lot of the work that goes into love and care is provided by women. Um, and so I think there is a kind of already a gendered set of normative conditions there underpinning Honneth's approach that I don't know if he's as reflexive about as he should be. And then the third area where I think Butler is doing some really interesting work is where she develops almost what we might think of as a sociological reading of Hegel, where she looks at how the relations of, of, of recognition render us vulnerable, but our social positioning means that we're not equally so, and the kind of established normative relations around recognisability shape what we might think of as the field of intelligibility within which re relations of recognition are played out. So I think what Butler does is really interesting in taking, almost taking Hegel and to a degree by implication Honneth on a step by showing how um, it is risky to overly romanticise a transformative emancipatory notion of recognition, um, one which is not sufficiently reflexive about the enduring relations of paternalism that can, can exist within that. As an example, just off the top of my head, I don't know if this works or not, but um, I remember being in a really quite privileged quite left wing but really quite privileged area in London with lots and lots of Black Lives Matter posters up in the window and I think you know I spent the day where with some family friends and um, didn't see a face that wasn't white the whole day and of course came away thinking that okay there is something going on here in terms of recognition but is there really a radical reflexive questioning of why all the people who live here are from a particular background and why the area is inaccessible socially, economically, perhaps in other ways I haven't thought about culturally for other groups of people. And I think probably somebody like Butler might say, OK, there is a form of recognition going on here, but it's a very paternalistic one and it's lacking that radical reflexivity that we really need to question the, the structural social relations of precarity that kind of perpetuate something which is actually then just becomes really quite rhetorical and symbolic. Anyone can put a poster up in their window. Um, sorry, again, that was a bit long winded, but there's a lot to think about there. So, yes, thank you. This is work that I'm really hoping to be doing um, on study leave in the spring term. So, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely pick up on both of your questions at that point. Oh, thanks. Um, I can see questions in the, in the chat as well, uh, and uh, I think Chinsi has suggested that one way forward uh, would be to continue um, uh, kind of examining these examples, uh, you know, of um, recognition protests and further problematize them because uh, uh, anti-Trump protest was criticized for excluding women of color and, uh, mm -hmm. and the GNL groups that are transphobic and et cetera. Um, so she can see the force of separation in these examples of solidarity. Um, and sim similarly, I'm looking for the comment that Tersha made. Yes, so that also raises the, the question to the, of, of the extent to which we may resist being misrecognized. So Sertia, as a non-binary person, do not want to be recognizable in cis heteronormative terms. So um, 
is that how you see uh, these kind of projects of, of recognition? I mean, the key for uh, problematizing further, uh, I, I suppose, frameworks by which we are recognized or not? Yeah, I think that's absolutely it. Um, I think this is something Butler's written about in Frames of War. Um, and Nick, I think you've written about this as well. And I think Sersha and um, Chinzi, I think you both raised really important points. I mean, I guess there are two two things going on here. One is a, almost a kind of rhetorical empirical point, which is these examples, I sort of put them in to, to, to illustrate some points, but they do need much more careful thought because you're absolutely right. A, a major challenge, if we're thinking about um, recognition, relations of recognition, and how those relations might form the basis for an ethics and politics of solidarity moving forwards, particularly, say, in the feminist movement, um, is, you know, we can't we can't risk simply perpetuating a kind of homogenizing sameness, assuming that the only way to stand in solidarity is to recognize our sameness um, and, and either kind of reify, commercialize, or eradicate and, and negate our differences. So the question then becomes, how do we form bonds of solidarity based upon a recognition of the mutual vulnerabilities engendered by our differences, but also be reflexive about our differential social positioning? So that's a major challenge for social movements. Um, uh, and then the other point, I guess, is that it's that challenge that leads me to want to try to explore different ways of thinking about what recognition might be as the basis for an ethics and politics of solidarity and of vulnerability and resistance. Um, and, and by this, I mean a mode of recognition which is reflexive enough not simply to be about bequeathing pre-established terms of recognition on those who are otherwise non or misrecognized or marginalized, but actually to engage in an ethics and politics that is about transforming and shifting the very terms of recognition, the basis of intelligibility. Because, you know, Butler is absolutely at pains to emphasize her view that our encounters with one another are already premised upon established terms of recognition. So we need modes of recognition that will enable us to stand together and shift the terms of recognition. Um, just to, I mean, this is this is a, a, almost a kind of um, trite example, but just going back to something like Athena Swan. So Athena Swan, for those of you sort of not working in the UK, but Athena Swan is um, is um, uh, uh, an award which is about recognizing um, um, actions that promote gender equality within academic departments. It began life as a way to encourage women um, into STEM subjects, and it's now now applies across a range of subjects. Um, but it very much focuses on giving an, an account again to use Butler's terms, giving an account of what is done to support the careers of women. It's very it, uh, it's very very binary and hierarchical in its orientation. Um, and um, it, it's very out of step with most of the research, certainly the critical reflexive research on gender. Um, and yet it's very difficult if you're working in a department that wants to get an award, it's very difficult to manoeuvre oneself into a position of recognition whereby you can have some influence on changing the terms by which you and the work that you and your colleagues do might be recognised. So we have no choice but to acquiesce to what is actually a very paternalistic, normatively orientated and largely rhetorical mode of recognition. So changing the terms of recognition, rethinking intelligibility beyond a reification, not just of sameness, but also of difference, is absolutely vital, I think, if we're to find some kind of reflexive, acceptably reflexive 
approach to recognition as the basis of political activism and solidarity. So they're really important points, Chinzia and, and Sosha. Thank you for, for raising those. We have, uh, thanks Melissa, a really thoughtful um, uh, answer. Uh, I, I can see some comments here. Lovely Nancy Harding is here. She said, thank you for a rich and stimulating paper. Every sentence merits discussion and uh, further exploration, and I couldn't agree more. Um, Karen Dale also uh, agreed with Nancy, uh, and thank you for the wonderful talk. We have a question from Owain. Uh, thank you, M Melissa. Fascinating and challenging. <laughs> My brain is trotting to keep up. Do you have any reflections on what all of this might mean for climate change and the potential for climate justice? Not much hope for relational recognition in the sense of empathy for the lived experience of people bearing worse consequences. For example, Pakistan right now, which is horrible, um, as a driver for, for meaningful action. Given the time constraints, we are reduced to playing to more self-obsessed form of recognition before life on, on the planet is taken seriously as an issue. Thanks, so in that, 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 I mean, that's such an important issue to emphasize. It's not my area of expertise, but it's obviously for all of us a grave area of concern. And for many of us, um, uh, an area of, of, of activist um, work. Um, I mean, if we think about what's happening in Pakistan and the way that we are responding to it right now, if we think about what happened in India, you know, when we were over one of the worst waves of COVID here and people were literally, um, you know, traveling, traveling for miles, desperately scrambling around on social media, trying to get oxygen for their their loved ones. Um, and we saw people literally dying in the streets. We're now currently seeing, you know, not not just individuals and their families, but whole villages being being swept away underwater and, and drowning. Um, and, and what do we do? Um, um, a shield member is writing actually is very helpful to us here in thinking about and actually in taking a long hard look at ourselves in terms of our response so for membe what we are doing is we are shoring up we are we are borderizing our differences we are working with kind of um notions of uh them and their um different geographies different people we are reifying the differences between us and failing catastrophically to recognize not just our basic mutual vulnerabilities just simply because we just don't happen to be in that position right now but we could very easily be um so we're catastrophically failing to recognize our intersubjective vulnerabilities but also we're only just beginning to think about the relationship between self others um those we see as like us those we see as different from us and our wider social and planetary environment um, and actually relations of recognition which are reflexive and which take us right back to our very basic sense of vulnerability have got to be at the forefront of people's minds I mean we're you know what's going on around us couldn't be a more pertinent example of the urgency of that and yet we are buried in in notions of borderization and a kind of netro necropolitics to use men-based terms in which we are simply shoring up our own resources so how many people will actually open up their homes to people to share heat this winter probably very few of us because that's just not the way we live so it's not us as individuals or families but the way that we live the terms of recognition that we operate with that are just unsustainably problematic. This is not very cheery talk for the beginning of the academic year, is it? Um, but these are really fundamental um, issues for us to not just think about, but actually have absolutely at the forefront of our minds. So I'm really glad you sort of highlighted that area that I, I kind of neglected a bit, I think, in the focus of what I was saying, but it absolutely needs to be there and needs to be foregrounded. Thanks, Owen. Uh, thanks, Melissa. Kate Kenny said, thank you very much for inspiring talk. Love the focus on persistence in bodies as signs. Looking forward to hearing more. And Alessandra Fennell, one of our lovely PhD students, have a great question. 
She said, I'm wondering if the desire for recognition may create uh, in a certain way new normative categories which can cast off all the bodies and beings that can't fit into these categories. Yeah, uh, um, thank you. That's a fantastic question and, 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 and puts in a much clearer, more succinct way what I was trying to get at earlier in thinking about um, a reflexive mode of recognition, which is driven in part by um, effort, a constant struggle to change the terms of recognition. So not simply rejecting the normative um, terms, the modes of intelligibility and the subject positions on offer. So like when a healthcare worker says, I'm not a hero, I'm somebody who works really hard and is very skilled, very underpaid. I don't have access to adequate protective equipment. So my own health and safety and that of the people I'm caring for is compromised. And actually a discourse of heroism simply detracts from that. That kind of creating new normative categories, almost a kind of post heroic healthcare discourse. That's exactly the kind of recognition I'm thinking about, demanding recognition on different terms. So casting off a conscious, deliberate, collective casting off of the terms of intel intelligibility and the subject positions on offer, creating tactically new categories, new ways of being, thinking beyond binary categories, thinking beyond hi hierarchical categories. I think there is some work going on. I'm not entirely pessimistic. I think there is some interesting, really important work going on with that. I think it will take time to filter through. I think I'm sometimes quite naive on this, but I do think that social media is potentially having some impact here. Um, so I have teenage, or I have um, one teenage child uh, and, and a daughter in her early 20s. And amongst their friendship groups and my daughter's colleagues, gender as a binary category is seen as incredibly outmoded. And actually just living beyond gender is something that they take for granted so much that it's not actually something they engage with to all intents and purposes in a very everyday way they have ostensibly cast off the kind of categories and the classifications of fit um that that you're you're referring to so i'm 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 cautiously hopeful that we are beginning some work in that direction. Of course, I see these things as dialectical, so there will always be pullback and reassertions of a binary hierarchy. And I suspect, you know, the, the 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 conservative government that is currently being assembled in the UK is going to be doing a lot of um, work in that direction. So yeah, there, there's something to continue working against for sure, but I am cautiously optimistic about changes taking place. Thanks for raising that point. Um, yeah, speaking of change, um, I hope you don't mind me kind of returning us a, a bit back to the theory. Um, I am struggle with uh, envisaging the potential for change, looking through like Hegelian account of of the recognition, you know, and the kind of that the same. Um, the si similar kind of dialectical approach that Butler takes, even though I'm kind of a believer that that's what what takes place, what Butler says that it does when she she uh, talks about recognition, um, which makes me a bit pessimistic. And this is only because uh, um, in in Hegelian terms, uh, as we know, so you, as you described in in your talk, um, a change. I mean, there is some kind of change that happens on cognitive level between two subject master and slave where they um, recognize each other's dependability uh, and that kind of changes them as, as subjects, but doesn't really change the status quo. Master still remains master, slave still be becomes mm -hmm. and remains slave. Um, so structurally, materially speaking, not much changes. And in Butler's term, which I am kind of more um, more aligned with, because I, from experientially speaking, that's how I can recognize recognition taking place. That we are embedded in these normative frameworks, uh, and uh, uh, you know, in them, some of us are 
recognized or partially recognized or completely unintelligible. Um, and the, when the change take place, it's it's very much random. It's when a norm kind of fails to repeat itself uh, seamlessly. Um, but still, it's not it's not necessarily kind of the change that we wanted or change that we strive to achieve. It's just a change. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm I'm just struggling to find hope, I suppose, in uh, kind of because the change that we desire to see in the world, um, you know, to save climate, uh, you know, to be kinder to immigrants, to uh, you know, um, to be kinder to to the strangers by wearing masks and all these different examples that we to be kinder, uh, you know, to women's bodies. Um, all of these things, I just, uh, I, you know, I kind of struggle to see the hope is if change is so random. Um, so I was just wondering if you have a comment towards that. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, so much to think about there. And in some ways, I think you've almost kind of answered your own question. You don't need me. Um, so, you know, in the Hegelian dialectic, as I understand it, and I may have got this wrong, but, you know, in, in, in Butler's reading of it as well, um, if a normative transformation doesn't take place, then, the, then then there isn't a relation of recognition. Now, Butler interprets that and she puts it very nicely in a very often quoted um, phrase from her writing where she says, um, you know, we're all undone by each other. And if we're not, then we're missing something. And I think, you know, if I if I didn't think she would hate it so much, I would probably have that on a T-shirt. Um, because for me, that kind of encapsulates how she understands recognition. If there isn't a normative change that 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 involves everyone kind of giving something away, sharing something, being transformed, becoming something else in a way that is not necessarily unidirectional, but 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 in a way that we can't ever go back to how we were before then that's and that doesn't happen then that's not change as we might imagine it or understand it or hope for it in an emancipatory way that just means that something's happened so if i put a poster in my window saying you know climate emergency turn your lights and your heating off i'm not actually doing anything there is no change there is no alteration nothing evolves and if we think about that relationship potentially between ourselves and others. And I'm not, I don't just mean individuals here, I mean by selves, those we see as like us, who we want to offer recognition to and who we seek recognition from. And also that kind of marginalized, misrecognized, un unintelligible group of others whose difference becomes reified, who Membe sees as just a pollutant almost, who we don't or says that we see as a pollutant, we, we neither covet nor offer them recognition, and the wider kind of planetary environment that we're in, if we do not engage in relations of recognition in which each, so we're moving beyond a dialectic, in, in a kind of trialectical relationship, if we don't move into that kind of transformational relationship, then nothing is going to change. Um, and that's why people will keep drowning in Pakistan. That's why people in India won't be able to breathe, because actually something is becoming arrested, getting stuck in those moments that Neil Howard wrote about um, in that potential for a kind of trialectical transformation. I guess we have to be hopeful because what else can we be? Yeah, I, I suppose you are absolutely right there. Um, you know, we have to find a way to be hopeful. And I like that trialectical, uh, you know, framework. I'm going to continue thinking about that. I can see that there are comments and questions from uh, other people. Sheena Vachan is, is here. Hi, Sheena. Hi, um, Sheena. Uh, she said, wonderful. Thank you, Melissa. I will also be thinking... Uh, about your work for some time. I look forward to many more conversations on the conditions of intelligibility and recognition. I love the connection to the visceral and messy relations this creates and the idea of consciously and collectively casting off, uh, which in turn may create its own contentiousness. 
um, jo Joe Bruce, uh, hi Joe, said uh, it really was wonderful walk my brain <laughs> up properly after holiday mine too uh, uh, as well. Um, yes, so, so many I can't keep up with comments and I'm just being mindful of the time and, and the need to wrap up. But uh, what a wonderful uh, food for thought. Uh, Melissa, thank you so much for being our, our guest. And I hope that we can continue these uh, conversations going forward. Uh, uh, and as you're writing your book, and I'm for one, can't wait to, to read it once it's done. So um, thank you for doing that. It's so kind. Thank you very much for inviting me and for organising everything. I really appreciate it. Thank you for your lovely, very encouraging uh, comments and uh, and for giving up your time to join us. And thank you so much for all the questions. You've given me so much to sort of take away and think about. So I couldn't couldn't possibly ask for more. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you again for, from uh, me as well uh, to our wonderful participants and to you, Melissa. And just for, uh, before we leave, I just wanted to remind everyone uh, that uh, we have another wonderful guest, Professor Alison Pullen, and our special guest, uh, Jenny Halin, uh, are joining us on Monday in GOP, talking about different styles of writing that Melissa uh, mentioned today. Mm -hmm. And I saw that uh, uh, lovely uh, Nancy Harding is here, so I hope uh, to see Nancy there as well, uh, considering that she uh, is one of the editors of, of the book that Alison and, and Jenny and Nancy edited that I uh, mentioned. So thank you all very much again and see you Monday. Thanks so much. We'll look forward to seeing you again on Monday. Take care, everyone. Bye. <laughs>